say uh, einen wunderschönen guten Morgen, Frau Jambor. Perfect. <laughs> also a great morning to you. It's, maybe it's not. Yeah, good. we are. No, no, it's no morning. It's afternoon. It's no morning. <laughs> we are three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And Mark is in Canada. It's three, three a.m. in the morning in Canada. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> good morning, yeah, an early morning. Yeah, that, that's really impressive. Three o'clock in the morning. Wow. <laughs> can you do can you do a workshop at three in the morning, Johannes? <laughs> uh, will be cool. it would be quite a different workshop at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I did one, I did one at five in the morning with Guatemala before. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. And it was really tough, you know, because <laughs> you're not up yet, you know, I mean, you're physically up, but your mind is still, you know, elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. uh, three o'clock is really very tough because it's That's exactly in the middle of the night. When you're doing yes. it at midnight or maybe at one o'clock, you, you stay longer. Or when it's five o'clock, you stay up earlier. Uh, but there you really get uh, stolen your night. <laughs> You are a real hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. That's another event, right, Mark? You have another event coming up today, right? So <laughs> Yeah, another one in Asia, but this one is in the morning, tomorrow morning. So I'm at late at night tonight, so <laughs> I hope I can get my nap in. But uh, it's, it's a lot of... <laughs> Maybe you switch your uh, sleeping time to Asian uh, time, yeah? So <laughs> anyway... Um, Ivan, you are still connected with Antonio? Uh, he retired, actually, yes, but I can contact him. What, what, what's going on? No, 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 it's funny because I, I was invited from an American institution uh, from MIT and the Connecticut Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. um, and this today, there will be a meeting with them again. And Antonio was in the last meeting. Ah, as the representative Antonio, of yeah. Indonesia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Antonio, yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know. I mean, he took, I think he studied PhD, his PhD in, uh, uh, first in Canada. So, but then he also did a lot of work with the American University. So I don't know which one though. So he might be uh, uh, connected there somewhere. But he officially retired from, from Chiputra. Actually, okay. uh, uh last year yeah right after i left so he a few months later he officially retired he's still in in the in the board but he's no longer active as a as a director because the foundation was disbanded anyway so yeah okay while we're waiting for some more people uh eva so uh please be uh uh understandable that asians are always uh uh, here especially indonesians are notorious for their late coming so uh before they always say you know uh traffic jam was pretty bad so i was late uh, now they're all at home and they're still late so i said maybe the door was jammed so they're stuck somewhere so uh, but uh, in the meantime we were just gonna gradually start with our discussion what we have left off yesterday so uh Good morning to uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, also, good afternoon for those who are joining from Indonesia. Uh, welcome to our second day uh, webinar today. Uh, this is going to be the continuation of our discussion from yesterday. Uh, and today, again, we have our distinguished uh, uh, sources uh, we have uh, mark q sam from joining us from toronto canada and we have uh, uh, professor johannes lindner joining us from uh, vienna austria and together with him we have also eva jambor also uh, joining us from uh, vienna austria uh, and uh, we're not going to listen to the ministerial message again, so uh, uh, we can save time on that. So, but uh, we're just going to go straight to the uh, discussion. 
anyway, uh, I was uh, speaking earlier uh, with Mark that that was uh, actually inquiry from one of the participants yesterday about uh, about the mindset uh, change. Uh, I guess uh, he or she is a teacher or educator. And this person was asking basically, uh, how do we know whether our students, a group of students have actually uh, transformed or acquired their mindset to become entrepreneurial? Yeah, uh, that would be uh, required for them if they want to be successful as an entrepreneur in the future. So uh, I think I want to start with that question today. So Mark, if you want to say a few words uh, on that for a couple of minutes, so uh, maybe you can elaborate that as you are the expert on that one. <laughs> well, I, 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 I defer to my esteemed colleagues, uh, Johannes and Eva um, on that. In terms of measuring and understanding it, um, and I'm just wondering, Yvonne, if I should answer this question and then go into the presentation after uh, Johannes and their other guests have a chance to answer it. Okay. Is, is that um, okay? Yeah. I, I would just say that the, in, terms of me, in terms of measuring and understanding, I, <laughs> it's really a difficult question. Um, there are a couple indicators that we have used to help us to get a better understanding of a growth mindset um, and an entrepreneurial mindset. And I, I think one of the, some of the good indications that you need to do about growth mindset is really measure various things. And we spoke a little bit about growth mindset of measuring that tool, which helps us to have the understanding of being able to get feedback, and to have to take risk. And so that's one measure you can use and it's on their website. And later I'll post it in the uh, chat for you of where to go. And the second indication I would use is actually called grit, um, which is the tool, the mindset or understanding of the person who is the number one indicator of whether or not they will be to be able to measure success or indicate if they'll measure success. And so those are two indicators I would use um, to try to understand an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, there are quite a few other measures of, for example, using your imagination, motivation, emotional intelligence, and these are all things that can also be used. And um, after Johannes, and I'll give you an indication though of what happens to know when you don't have uh, entrepreneurial belief, a whole belief side about entrepreneurship. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I understand that Johannes told me that Eva used to uh, 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 get involved or run some uh, entrepreneurship program in uh, uh, schools uh, uh, in Salzburg in Austria. So maybe based on your experience, uh, before we go to Johannes to, to, sum, to sum it up, maybe you can also share your personal experience when you were dealing with this uh, students or, or kids basically uh, about their mindset. I mean, is there some kind of an indicator or, or, or even measurements that you can uh, use to, 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 to see that? Eva, what do you think? What we are doing is we, we, uh, we work in a, in a whole region of Austria uh, where the idea is to implement the, uh, our entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurship program from first grade. And we do this since 2018. And at the moment we have around 7,000 uh, kids uh, studying with our program. And uh, we do a lot of teacher training. And at the moment, our, our uh, kind of measuring is to, um, to have interviews with the teachers who uh, work with the, with the kids. And what we have noticed is that uh, there is a big difference for those who, who, so the teachers are used to work to kids. They are not teachers for the first year. 
and they see that there is a big difference first for themselves as they themselves have changed their attitude. So they expect more from their kids than they have before. And they said that this makes the big changement in the, in the classroom. That uh, the, the fact that they have higher expectations and they say, okay, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that you can deal with this without me. I just give you, uh, give you some, uh, some indications how to do that. And then uh, we, we have very, really nice results that they say they were uh, surprised <laughs> at, the, at the beginning. They, they did not feel very comfortable because they wanted to, to manage the process more intensively at, as they were used before. And then they saw that the main, the main changement is that they have to have other expectations for the kids. So this is maybe something that I can share. Later, if you want to, I can also show you how we do, how we start. I have prepared some slides that you see how we start at first grades and how we, we upgrade the, 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 the program, how we implement it in, in Salzburg. Okay, thank you. Uh, Johannes, maybe your thoughts. Um. I would like to speak about this from three perspectives. Uh, the first perspective is from a strategic one. Last week we presented the action plan for entrepreneurship education and in the action plan we also have indicators inside. And we have so-called input indicators and output oriented indicators. And we had an intensive discussion which indicators would be very fine to know and of course, we all know it's much more easier um, to make indicators about skills because it's much more easier to measure it. It's a bit more sensitive uh, to make good measures about mindset change. And therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy when Mark later on will show us how they are doing this in Canada. We are always very willing to learn something new. Um, we... Uh, that, that's the first perspective. I think that's very important when you implement entrepreneurship education in the school system that you find out which are good instrument for indication and which are instrument for indication which you can really use on a regular basis. Um, second perspective. When you're doing a, a science uh, research project, of course, you have much more indicators, but this is just a thing what you can do temporarily and not regular because uh, you make a lot of interviews and so on. Therefore, get, you get much more information. Um, um, therefore, that's, that's, but that's not, not something what you can do on a regular basis. Third perspective. The third perspective is the idea, can you create learning materials where you include a, a kind of self-assessment and peer assessment where you automatically uh, include this kind of reflection in the learning process. And uh, when Eva later will show uh, how we implemented entrepreneurship education in the primary schools in a whole region, um, she will also show first, like Joni yesterday asked, how we are doing this, how we are doing this. But in the second step, she will also show how uh, some of the indicators are used in a potential oriented uh, learning approach where you have reflection insight and where the teacher gets a different way of reflection as an indicator how the mindset has changed from the kids. And it's not an indicator that you get notes. It's an indicator that you have a different way uh, of understanding how your, your learners have developed. Uh, these are three perspectives. Uh, and in my opinion, this has a high value when you are able to include this. In primary school, uh, of course, there's a challenge that are very young kids. And therefore, some things are not so easy to ask them. But Eva can show this much more better. In, when you are working in secondary level, uh, in secondary level, in fact, you can use valid testings. Um, uh, uh, therefore, we are very open. We are using some of this testing. Uh, Eva can also show which kind, maybe uh, Eva, it would be great when you show how in potential uh, in the Be A Yes Challenge, we, we are changing the, the, the stages, how we get this kind of, of information from primary schools 
to the kids when they are 10 up to 14 and when they are older. In when they are older, we have really a valid testing inside. Um, and we know that the youngsters appreciate this a lot uh, because youngsters like to know about themselves and they like to understand uh, where they are. Um, but it's important that you are not only doing the testing, you, this should be a part of the normal learning process. It's as a development step. Therefore, these three perspectives, um, we have a whole discussion of uh, indicators. Uh, for the ministry, the input-oriented indicators are much more popular because it's much more easier to, to collect these indicators. How many hours did we invest? How many and so on? Of course, we you know that it's, it's, a, it's, it's an element that you know, okay, the learners are learning now 100 hours per, per, uh, in this period uh, and so on. Uh, it's a question of the frame, uh, how you can organize entrepreneurial learning. But in fact, it's, uh, it's not so uh, spectacular, this kind of indicator. Outcome oriented in particular, the development of the competence, the development of the entrepreneurial mindset, they are much more attractive. Wow, interesting. I cannot even imagine when you do self-assessment or peer assessment at primary school level. Because I'm always, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but yeah, uh, we would- Just give you an example. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. But let's just go back to Canada first. Mark, you want to show us something? Yeah, I wanted to, um, if I can share my screen here, let me make sure if I got, um, sorry, if I just grab this here. Um, sorry, here, here's the right screen. I can blow that up. What I, what I wanted to talk about was just to go back to the big picture of what happens and most people are equating entrepreneurship with creating, while entrepreneurship is a means of many different things, many people equate it to business, but it also is a means of creating your life purpose. And you could have entrepreneurship in, um, in nonprofit organizations, but a lot of it revolves around money and money beliefs for a lot of people in making their choice. And what happens is that I've found that for adults, what occurs is that much later in life, this is what I deal with a lot on a personal coaching belief, is that people are trying to determine in their life what they want in life and how they can achieve it. And I just want you to very quickly, in order to have the right attitude towards the next couple of slides, just for you as teachers is how much money do you need to be financially free? How much do you want to be earning annually? And how much do you feel you can earn today? And just write those questions down very quickly and we'll continue through it. And this will just give you room for thought. But I continue to quote this because mindset is all about mastering life. And one of the things we're trying to teach with entrepreneurs is how do you master value creation in your life to obtain what your life purpose and to gain what you want to do in your life? And he just says, in order to master life, you need to teach your mind to be calm, kind, and creative. And that's really mindset, right? And what we're one of the areas we're talking about specifically is beliefs. I'll s believe it when I see it, or do I see it when I believe it? And I'm going to go right back to self-development um, and uh, the granddaddy of self-development, Napoleon Hill, who wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. And he says, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And th that's the book, which is a classic for all of self-development uh, here, especially in North America. And it's very interesting that the book was written in 1937, but almost all the book, very few people know, comes from an interview that he had with Andrew Carnegie, who on a dollar for dollar basis, if you had to convert it, is still was one of the five richest people in the entire world. And he wanted his legacy to be 
not how much money you had, but how do people can accumulate for themselves to create their life that they wanted and how to alleviate themselves from poverty. And Napoleon Hill asked a question, what is the first move a man makes when he's through with poverty and has become determined he will have riches? And Andrew Carnegie says very profoundly, he says, the man who prepares himself to change from poverty to riches is something like the farmer who wishes to convert the forest into productive field. He first clears away the timber and debris, then he plows the ground and conditions the soil. After that, he plants the seeds. And I'm just gonna go, and then he goes on to talk about this. It is precisely the same pr pr procedure with the man who makes up his mind to be done with poverty. He must clear his mind of all the negatives and self-imposed limitations. And this is what he calls clearing the forest, right? removes the negative beliefs and emotions. Then he makes one's self-success conscious. That means he plows the fields and creates empowering belief. He becomes success or abundantly conscious. And then he's in a position to adopt a major definite purpose. I, what do you wanna do? And begin expressing it in action through a definite plan, i.e. plant the seeds and create value. And so he goes through two things first, which is about beliefs before he even comes about trying to create your plan of action of what you want to do. And very few people have actually understood that. And if you also have the mind, right mindset, he says, the right success consciousness, he will not want to quit. And that is why success consciousness is important or the right mindset. This preparation, he quotes in the end, is an absolute essential for the acquisition of riches. And when we're talking about money, we will get back there. And I want you to understand now though, what actually happens to us and our, the beliefs we set in life about ourselves and why when once we adapt these beliefs, it becomes very hard later in life to actually go back, find the beliefs in your head and reconvert them. And we hear all of these things is in our childhood, and this is in North America, I don't know what the sayings are maybe in your countries, but I'm sure they're very similar things that are in your countries. One, the first, one of the first things is if you're poor, you always say, I can't afford it, right? Or money doesn't grow on trees. And then, we then go from there and says, well, time is money, and therefore you have to use your time appropriately, and or you have to work hard for money. Um, and then the rich will get richer and poor, will get richer while the poor gets poorer, i.e. you need money to make money. And then money comes and money goes, sometimes for people, there's more to life than money, and then money is the root of all evil which is in some kind of religious context, you always have those. And the reason why this is, these seven beliefs combined together to create what happens to most people in life, it's based on the system that we used to have in the ninth, before the 20th century where we could easily create the life that we wanted. So this was a pattern where you would basically, if you can't afford it, then you have to go get money. And if time is money, you get an education, so your time is worth more, okay? So now we have to get an education. And then when there, and once you get your education, you go out and you, and therefore that's why doctors and lawyers were believed to have been the best professions, right? And then you have to work hard for your money. Therefore you work more hours than you ever did before. And, if you have to get rich, then you only have so much money, therefore you have to save and you live below your means and save money. Uh, and therefore you carefully put the money because it's so precious, you put it in the bank instead of investing it. And then finally after that is, I only care about being comfortable, therefore I need to have this work-life balance. And then money is the root of all evil. Therefore, I'm not, not rich and I can't afford what I do because there are terrible people like Trump or the mafia while I'm a good person. 
And this is the, probably about 95% of the population. This is what we've been taught. And this is where we have with the whole school system. And I'm just gonna, just to give you an indication of why entrepreneurship is different and why you need entrepreneurship to break out of this, this, these beliefs that you have in your head. And the first is really about, the first thing we should be teaching is I can't afford this. And entrepreneurs teach that, you know, how can I afford this? The universe is abundant. That's an abundant mindset. The second and probably the most important part about entrepreneurship, the next two is the most important things about entrepreneurship. And that is time is money and therefore everything takes time. But, you know, we've seen that and the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is a, uh, a book which is here and very big in the United States, teach with the difference between what happens to rich people and what happens to poor people. And he teaches that rich people spend all their time not making money, but creating assets. And when you're doing that, the assets could be in creating real estate, creating a business, creating a digital product, creating a website about creation. And this is what the essence of entrepreneurship is. When you create an asset, that assets will continue to make money for you versus you actually having to spend your time making it. And that is one of the critical things that entrepreneurship does. And, it, and why do you wanna do that? Well, you know, the work ethic is that you have to work hard for your money, but the rich, or entrepreneurs, they make, hopefully they create a business when they're not there, their business is actually running for them 24 seven. And so you, you don't have to work hard for your money in the sense that you've already created the asset. And this is the difference between, the, the major, major difference between going to work and as a, going to work and living in that lifestyle and versus creating the life you want. And as, you, as, the, as the new generations, as we coming up through school, we're, they're all deciding their life purpose, that we're, going to, we're ending this thing about having to go to work just to make money. And instead, they're focused on creating the life that they want to live. And with entrepreneurship, they're beginning to understand if we can put it in their minds, that they can create and use their gifts and talents to create a better world while creating these assets that we actually want to have happen and creating an asset, which is a business, which will help you. And I just wanted to do one, one more point to all of this. And this is a very important point. And that when people, we all want, to, you know, we have this mentality that we want to create. And why do we, why does entrepreneurship allow you to create and do these things um, and help you to get out of this, what I call this belief trap? And it's a well known fact that every, we all want to, you know, there's this thing called law of attraction out there that if you think about it, you'll get it. But one of the big missing elements for the law of attraction in getting what you want. And this is what Andrew Carnegie talks about is that what we need to do is to teach people, which is what entrepreneurship does, is how do you create value for others? How do you create value by solving their problems? And the more value we create in order to obtain what we want. So if we wanted a million dollars, we need to obtain, we have to create a million dollars of value. And when you create a million dollars of value, that's when you will achieve what you want in life. And it's through value creation, one is able to exchange something of more value than what is received. And the more one helps other people, the more value we create, the richer we become. This is the principle of going the extra mile. This was back was what's really meant by the extra mile. And Andrew Carnegie says, I have never heard of anyone changing from poverty with riches without applying this principle and doing it as a matter of habit. And that's where I will end it because 
the idea then is to focus their efforts on creating assets that create value for others. And that is something which we need to instill instead of this going to work, going to school, get a job, working hard, how do you create value for others? And that's what the essence to me of what entrepreneurship is. And it changes your entire belief mindset. And then, then the question is, how do you teach people to do that? And that's the reason why I believe, you know, the belief or mindset is very important because now we've changed to how do we create value for others so we can create value for ourselves and obtain what we want in life. And then, you know, I'll leave it to Johannes and Eva to tell you how they do that. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark, for such a deep psychology of uh, entrepreneurial mindset. So uh, let's just go back to Eva. So Eva, you wanted to share with us how you actually do uh, uh, this entrepreneurial education. Yes, uh, if you allow me to share my, my screen. Uh, hold on. Mm, no. Uh, let me check with the, okay. the host. Uh, okay. uh, Octa. Eva, jetzt funktioniert es. Du bist yeah. noch. Yes. Okay. Hello, hello Miss Eva, the co-host. Okay. Now you're, you can share, Eva. Yeah, I have it. Thank you. So I've prepared uh, only some slides to show you how uh, we implement social entrepreneurship uh, uh, from the very beginning. So we even start at the first grade. And uh, we do it under uh, um, a name. And the name is Empowering Each Child. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Johannes explained to you that behind stands our Youth Start Entrepreneurial Challenges program. But our learning was that you can't go on with this name towards primary schools because they just think it too complex and they don't see why to do so. So we, 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 we choose a name that says what we are doing. And in fact, we do uh, empower those ch children. And therefore, the, the name of the program is Empowering Each Child. And uh, Johannes uh, yesterday showed you our TRIO uh, model, so our uh, definition of entrepreneurship. We use it also for the small kids, but we don't use this uh, uh, these very technical <laughs> names for it. So the, 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 we have chosen free, uh, free colors for that so that it is easier to understand for the teachers. And the yellow stands for let's develop and implement your ideas. The pink one is don't be afraid to try out new things, also encourage others. And the, the green one is use your ideas to help other people. Mark, I really liked what you said, of course. This is our mindset also of entrepreneurship, our understanding that your ideas should be used for the, for the, for the, for the value of all. So this is, this is the idea. And um, I show you now, because in Austria, we have decided, uh, although digital learning is, is coming ahead for primary schools, we need books. And we, 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 we definitely had to go back to, to some booklets. And we have, uh, uh, our program is a module based program, but we have, we have decided to put some models together to show it to the teacher when to implement them and which models to combine. And I will show this quickly to you. Uh, at the beginning, we have this, uh, uh, this mindfulness. This is the orange book, uh, mindfulness. Uh, and then we have a learning, holistic learning. I have it later on in English, but here I want only to show you, uh, to give you a quick view how we start. The first challenge uh, uh, is, is uh, for the, to the first challenge is dedicated the whole book. It's the BAS challenge. And this is definitely what I heard in, in Mark saying, this is positive psychology. This is how to get a growth mindset. This is seeing uh, your own strengths. We use it for four years. We start at the first grade and then we use it uh, all the, the years because our primary school ends after four years. And the first four years we, we use it as a portfolio for the own strengths of the kids. Then in the second year, we start with three other challenges. I will come to, back to them later. Then in the third grade, 
we have four that we have combined in a, in a green book. And then in the last year, in the fourth year, we have five challenges that we have combined in a yellow book. And now I would like you uh, to, show, to show to you that um, in, a, in another way. So if this trio model, if I put it in a tri triangle, I would put entrepreneurial culture as a basis. So this is our pink part. And there it's how to encourage myself and others. And there we have one basic challenge. And this is the, uh, I will show it you later. So then we have the other parts of the trio model. So you, you know it already, the co-entrepreneurial education and the uh, entrepreneurial civic education. And in the middle of that, we see the four C's, the 21st century skills, because we refer to all of them in our challenges. I let them come in now, the four C's, they are, they are uh, uh, well known. And if I build a building with that, I would say that we need one pillar that is our learning, holistic learning. These are methods that we introduce from the very beginning that kids learn how they can learn more effectively. And the idea is, the aim is that they get responsible for their own learning process. I repeat that because it's so important they get responsible for their own learning process. It's not to wait for a mark. It's to, to have my own aims and to follow them, to reach my goals. Yeah? So this is, this is with these methods. And we think it's so important that we, we do that in a mindful way, that we have a, a, a special pillow, which is for mindfulness. And now comes the most important challenge. We start with it, and it's not by chance that it's from the pink field. So it's a personal development. BAS, this is positive psychology. Concentrate on what is good for you. This is to develop this mindset that we uh, have been uh, talking about yeah then the next one is empathy empathy challenge where we use uh, uh, methods from uh, non-violent communication and then so this is should be for the f second grade and then we we uh, uh, recommend two challenges the one is a very typical entrepreneurial and get your ideas moving forward of course a classics the idea challenge together with the trash value challenge recycling adds value so this would be the next step but definitely we have to start with the bas because if not we don't we, we won't get this mindset although we have in all our challenges uh, um, exercises that help kids to, to develop this growth mindset. So the next challenge is uh, we recommend storytelling. So this is uh, all about uh, not important. You can imagine how we do storytelling for, for first graders, second graders, third graders. Then we have uh, a very uh, a financial challenge, the My Personal, where we help them to, to develop a feeling, becoming aware of price and value. We put this together with the Perspectives Challenge that you find down, tracking 20 euros, which is about the economic circle. So we go deeper inside also economic understanding and finding my role in this economic surrounding. And then we come uh, to a, a design thinking uh, challenge, uh, solving problems together. The, the idea, the center of this challenge are the SDGs and uh, to, to find hands-on solutions or for eight, nine year old kids. So they uh, get familiar with the SDGs and they find solutions in a uh, design thinking process. And then we have the, the last year uh, for, for our primary schools. It's the fourth grade. There we have the next uh, idea challenge that is uh, absolutely upgrading the first one. And this is, we have heard it in your speech, Mark, we create value. How can we do that? How can we be in the same way sustainable and do something for others? And then we have the lemonade stand challenge where we have our first selling experience. And then two very important challenges uh, in the green field where it's about social, uh, social uh, engagement. We have debating. So uh, this is of course uh, very important, uh, philosophizing together and the volunteer challenge for volunteering. And the last challenge, and this is not by chance the last, is the extreme challenge where we combine 
this uh, idea of achieving a big goal in small steps, we combine it with uh, physical exercises that kids are training. And this is a kind of summarizing of the whole process for the four years that you should have learned to set to achieve your own goals. And now we repeat it in one special challenge, how you can do that with a specific uh, idea. I have put here, uh, uh, Ivan, I can give you later on the, the, the presentation if you want to, uh, the, the, the gray, gray ones are not translated yet into English. All the rest exists also in English, but the gray ones are very recent developed in Austria and we had not the time uh, to, to, uh, to translate them in English. And here I show you how I do this in, in Salzburg. Because in the whole region of Salzburg, we got the chance from the Salzburg government that we can implement our program. And I show you the steps how we do. It's a kind of repetition what I said before, but here you see it in another graphic. So the, the, the thing that is surrounding and basing everything is our uh, learning, holistic learning and our mindfulness program. This is a kind of base that goes through all grades. And then we start with the BAS. I show here that we do it from the second grade, but in fact, we do it for the teachers. So we start with teachers always when they are teaching second grades, but later on we recommend to start with this challenge even at first grade. But our uh, teacher training start with teachers at second grade because we saw when we confront them with a new program, when they have a new class and they don't know the program yet, they won't implement it. But later when they know the program, they start at the first grade with some exercises from the BAS challenge. Then for the second grade, we have three challenges that we summarize in one book, then four challenges in another book, and then five for the fourth grade. And we uh, accompany, so what we do, uh, what we offer on students level is that we have prepared three kind of festivals for the second, third and fourth grade. For the first going together with the trash value ch challenge, we have a trash value uh, festival. Uh, for the third grade, together with the My Community Challenge, where we deal with the SDGs, we have a so-called inventors workshop, which is a design thinking process. And then we have the market day that goes together, of course, with the Lemonade State Challenge. So this is our whole, um, uh, what we offer for the kids. And then, of course, there is teacher training. So for, for each, uh, before the school year starts, I do the teacher, teacher training in April, May, June, so that they get prepared for the September session. And uh, uh, normally uh, they don't want to go to seminars very often. I do it in a very complex uh, version. So I offer two seminars for the start. And then I offer only one, uh, one afternoon but I, I, I bring them together at the end of this school year for a, an exchange of best practices. But the input they get in one afternoon and therefore we decided to do, to prepare our challenges in a very, in a very detailed way. So we have a book for, for teachers, a teacher's guide, where we give a step-by-step -step introduction to the challenges. So of the idea is if they have no chance to go to the, to the seminars, they could do it uh, also alone. We don't really recommend it because it's all about attitude and there we need to see them. So this is important, but I think you will have the same problem that they are not really willing to come very often. And therefore for us, it's important if we have a, a school which we work with, never to work only with one teacher at these schools because this poor teacher will get lost in his school. He needs at least one person who is supporting him or her in this new way of teaching. Uh, better, of <coughs> course, if there are more, but uh, we, we, we look uh, always to have minimum two or three teachers from one school. At the moment, I have around 300 teachers in Salzburg and I've been working with them for some years and they are really, they, they are our very uh, a fan community. So they are very good multipliers. And uh, the last thing uh, to show is the school development. This is very important. We, we, we try to get also, of course, the headmasters. And if it's possible, we offer uh, seminars for the whole school. So this is the best way, of course. 
if we get all teachers from one school together and we show all of them uh, all challenges. So this is a special way. Uh, not very many schools are open to that, but we had some and it was very uh, successful. And of course, to be sustainable at the end, we have to have this implemented in teacher um, at, at our pedagogical institutes. We have one, uh, one um, institute in Vienna uh, who offers this program. And so we hope that this will get uh, insight also through, through our students. Yeah. So this is, this is my, my presentation. Thank you so much, Eva. I mean, this is very uh, comprehensive and uh, I think it's going to be very useful for for all of us, especially for teachers at the uh, primary level. Now, however, uh, as uh, Johannes mentioned yesterday, um, the same situation happens here also in Asia. At primary school level, we usually have one classroom teacher in charge for several subjects. Uh, uh, I think until the fourth grade, uh, even for us until the sixth grade, except for subject like sports or music or art, when they usually have another teacher coming in. Uh, but then when we get to the higher level at the secondary level, or even at the university level, where basically one teacher or one instructor for one subject or at the university, one subject with several uh, uh, instructors, now things get very complicated because uh, then we start scratching our heads. Now, how do we actually uh, prepare this, these educators, teachers, and lecturers so that they can actually teach, uh, so-called teach in, in an entrepreneurial way? Because to my experience, you know, when you're a teacher, you will teach the same way you were taught when you were in school, because that's the only method you know and that you have personally experienced. Now, if you are asked to teach in a different way that you are not even familiar with, that could be challenging. And as, as Eva said, teachers especially, you know, or, or even lecturers, they think they are already smart so they don't need seminars yeah because uh they think seminars is only for those who who are not as smart as they are you know they're very reluctant to go to workshop or training even worse yeah because they're, oh i don't need to be trained now because i have already my phd why should i go to a, another training so uh, this is going to be very challenging i mean maybe johannes you have uh, some thoughts on that or before i ask also eva and mark to say a few words on that. And um, maybe I say something about when you are in a school are changing a tradition maybe, it's always a question how can you bring innovation inside a school, like in any organization. I think that's uh, the school is not a different in that way like any other organizations. Uh, institutions who are bringing innovation inside are changing procedures. Okay, how can you do this? As Eva mentioned, the highest success is when you do this in the team and not just a single teacher is trying to do this. When you're a team of two, three, four teachers in a school who are together like to learn this, then they can support them together. And that's uh, is something what we see that's a really uh, a, a success factor. Another success factor is that the principal, the headmaster is involved, uh, that he exactly knows what's going on. If there is a change of learning, also the headmaster has to understand what's going on in these classes because he gets questions from other teachers, he gets questions from parents, and he should explain this, what they are doing, how they are doing this. And I think this is a very important thing it, because I was always surprised that um, in fact, the implementation of entrepreneurship education in primary school with the teachers in the primary school is much more easier 
than with the teachers in secondary level. Why? There are three aspects. The first one is there is no teacher group in the school system than the primary teacher group who knows the kids better because they have 25, 30, 35 kids and they know them really very, very well. Um, other teachers normally have 200, 300 students. Therefore, for them, it's quite more challenging uh, how to know the students and to support them in the personal development. First reason. The second reason is they stay much more time together with the kids. Therefore, they are much more open for different experimental ways of learning. Because when you stay six hours, five hours, six hours per day with kids together, you are more open to think about that you can do something in a different way. Uh, and you have more time, in fact, than any other teacher normally has. Uh, and the third aspect is teachers in primary school are very oriented in developing the person. They see the kids in a holistic way. They do not see a subject. They see it, uh, I'm learning together with them, my, my, all the subjects, but they see that they want to develop the whole person. And of course, they like to develop skills, but they always also like to develop the person. And this is a really very, very special thing. I was very, very impressed when I got in touch with primary education teachers. Um, and um, Tony, as you asked yesterday, I think, and there is a fourth element, which is particularly important. You need to find the right language. Uh, that was one of the reasons that we changed the name and we are, uh, we are using only the subtitle Entrepreneurship Education. The, the head the title is Empower Each Child. Um, Eva and Ingrid are our multipliers there and both of them have, uh, have know the language for primary education teachers. Um, and it's important that you know the language because otherwise the teacher needs to translate this. And this is not a good idea. It's much more easier when you have someone who knows exactly the ways how are they using the words and with the kids and using this in this in the same way. Um, and therefore, I think it's uh, these are four aspects which are very special in primary education. If I hope I did not forget anything important. Thank you, Johannes. Yeah, this is this is really the fact that uh, uh, we, we <laughs> I want to add only the, the fact that as we do a lot of positive psychology, which is quite new for our teachers, they are not used to it yet. And when we offer that in our trainings, they see that it's not only for the kids. They don't understand it as a, as a, uh, a preparation for their work with the kids. They see that they have personal benefits from them. And therefore, I have also now during the pandemic, uh, I have uh, good uh, results with the teacher training. I, yesterday I had one. I, I have very often teacher training digital. And then I have very good feedback that they see, oh, you g gave me so much that I can use now for myself. So I see that the, the, the subject that we are offering with this BAS and with this idea of working on our growth mindset is supporting themselves also. And when they have understood that we offer something like that, then they say to others, yes, come to this teacher training. You get really <laughs> uh, something, something valuable from it. But we have first to find people that are, in, uh, that are motivated by us and then they are our multipliers. Because only with letters from the, the government uh, join this program, they, ca they don't come. We need, we need this example and then they need to, to see how it works. We can invite them in schools where it already works. So this is the way how it, uh, how it goes. Because I have all the support from the Salzburg government and also it's difficult to get them on board <laughs> because it's, it's, on a, it's on a voluntary basis. But the, the benefit they feel for themselves is the, the best, uh, the best uh, um, uh, how, to, how to say, uh, the best advertisement for our program. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Eva. I mean, I think for primary school, if the school principal says to all the teachers, I want this to be done, I think it can be pretty much done. But at the secondary level, at the university, if the president of the university says something, you know, it's like, 
the lecture is over. Well, I, I don't care. I will not do it. So, uh, so uh, I think when you try to teach entrepreneurship at secondary or university level, then you're choosing actually the more difficult pathway to do it rather than when you do it at the primary level, I suppose. Uh, but maybe, uh, Johannes, what would you suggest, you know, how we, uh, uh, what kind of approach we should use, you know, for a higher education level? In higher education level, um, you mean university or secondary level schools? Both, I would say. Both. Um, I think in, in university, uh, at secondary level, I think they, maybe I'd like to add one thing for primary, then I answer this question. Um, I think there are two aspects when you implement something. The first aspect, you have a pioneer phase and you implement it exactly like Eva was mentioned this. And then you need to want that it's going on on a continuing basis. And we realize you need two aspects that really this is going on in the future. There is one aspect, what we call festivals, that you have something where the people are celebrating from time together and to see them. And the second aspect is that you have a, a working group where the teacher uh, yearly, maybe one or maybe a second time, are meeting them together, reflect what they are planning to do this year, that, that there's something going on in, and also in the future. Otherwise, they have a phase where they are enthusiastic. Some of them are going on with that and some of them are losing later on some aspects. Um, okay, go we do, do the secondary level. On secondary level, um, we had different approaches how we started with entrepreneurship education. Uh, because this, the, the system in these uh, schools are so diverse. Um, we started in a school type where we have a very homogeneous syllabus. And in this school type, we selected some subjects because in the school, you have 12 or 13 subjects per year. And uh, it would be quite challenging that you are working with all of the teachers together. Uh, otherwise, you, it's really for the implementation in a whole country, very difficult when you have to work with so many teachers together. Therefore, we selected, okay, we have on the one hand teachers who are teaching business-oriented subjects. On the other hand, we have language-oriented subjects. And we saw these two types of teachers are very fine to cooperate because they have a, a larger number of hours and they are working over a longer period together with the students. It's not a subject which is just for one or two years. Uh, we have a third kind of subject where we saw that it's very attractive to cooperate with them. These are design, painting, handcraft oriented teachers because for prototyping and so on, this is a very attractive a group of teachers. And we try that in a pioneer phase, a team of two, three teachers from these different subjects are the pioneer group, where, where they are starting to implement entrepreneurship education in their subjects together. And not as a single teacher, because we see that the single fighter, it's, it's a phenomenon, which is a very difficult thing when you want to, 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 to implement it in the whole school later on. And we realized that this is quite successful when you have a team from the beginning and a team of teachers who are really teaching in common classes. Uh, because then they can share how it's going on, they reflect how the teachers and students are going on. And we always have to see these teachers are not working only with this class, they are working in fact with two or 300 students. Uh, this is a really very large challenge, uh, how they can organize this. Um, Okay, you have a team of teachers and hopefully then you have another team of teachers and so you're increasing the number of the teachers. And in the third step, we are offering a school internal training for a larger group of teachers than in the school. But in the beginning, you need some teachers who are pioneers who say, yeah, that this is something fine for our school. Um, and we like that some other teachers in the school also get involved with this virus that something is going on in this area. Um, okay, this is the approach how we think it could run quite nice on school level. On university level, I think it's much more complex because university professors are not cooperating. They are single individuals. 
and <laughs> uh, they are not seeing that they have the needs to cooperate with a colleague. You're uh, also the, teaching at university, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we have to see this, that uh, there is an institution who is offering a program and maybe they're cooperating with a service institution, but not with other professors. It's very seldom that you can reach this. But I think at the university level, we have to see, maybe that's fine, uh, when you get things in a structure. And I think we have to see three aspects and on university level. We have to see that there is a programs are offering in a sensitive phase, which means for students who are uh, not doing this in a regular part of the program, what they are studying. Um, in Vienna, for instance, in the university, they are offering a program which is called the Change Maker Program. It's a one year program, it's extracurricular, but it's really popular. A lot of students are trying to, to, to go there. Uh, because they have a very attractive program and a lot of students see they really they get something out of that. Although it's not a part of the regular study. Um, okay, then you have some parts which are part of a regular study. And then uh, you have something what we call there's a service center. And the service center is supporting uh, the realization of uh, student uh, projects. Uh, up to the moment that they are really doing startups. And in this thing, uh, the uh, Vienna University, where I think they are doing this very smart, they call this service team, that's, um, that's a team which they, 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 they invite students to support uh, other students and they call them wonder team they are bringing wonders to all of them. And that's really smart to be a part of this team. It's quite interesting. And they always have 50, 60 students who are doing entrepreneurial activities to support a, a larger group of other students. And of course, the universities are normally offering also spin-off projects um, with own centers, with a lot of capital normally inside. But this is something what is for a small group of students uh, very often pH oriented uh, when they are doing some spin-off activities. So as I would say on university levels, you see four levels. The first level that you have a sensitive program for a mass of students. Then you have some parts inside a regular program. And European-wide, we know with this regular program, we only reach an average 3% of the students. It's a very small number. Um, then you have some uh, programs with a service character. It's again, extracurricular. Uh, some of the universities are, are reaching much more a higher percentage with that. They have to offer uh, co-working spaces and so on uh, for free for students. And that's quite popular. Uh, and the last one is a spin-off centers. Uh, they normally have a lot of money uh, and they're supporting PhD projects uh, in health, in pharmacy and so on. And that's, that's, uh, you see these four aspects. Now I'd like to jump to the universities who are training teachers. In the teacher level, this is working different because on universities who are training teachers, uh, we see that the, these universities are cooperating in a different way. Um, there you have uh, a program uh, which is compulsory for all students. And there we try to bring in entrepreneurship from the beginning. Um, and this is, uh, and so you reach all students with a basic program. Uh, and we see that it's uh, something surprising that in teacher training, we have colleagues from art, from math, who are cooperating to support entrepreneurship education. It's quite different to other regular studies. And then you have a special program, specializations, but with this, you only reach 10, 50% uh, of, the, of the learners, uh, students who are going uh, later on as a teacher. Uh, but in that programs, you have a lot of activities inside. Um, but you're in competition with some other very nice programs. So you have a compulsory part. You have some teachers who are doing some special subjects in including entrepreneurship education. Did I lose Johannes? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I think, uh, okay, Johannes, we lost you for a couple of minutes. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> what was the last word I was saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you forgot what you just said. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I still know, but I don't know when you, it stops uh, that you get uh, it. Just a few, few uh, last sentences. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to show that on um, universities for all studies, it's quite a challenge to implement it, that you have these sensitive el elements, you have this compulsory, where, but you are only reaching a small number of students. Then you have these extracurricular activities where with around co-creation and so on, which are quite popular. And then you have spin-off programs. In teacher training programs at university level, um, I see it's important to have compulsory parts which are very early in the study. Uh, and in some universities, we see that they, they are open for that. Then you have some subject-oriented uh, colleagues who include entrepreneurship education. Uh, and then you have uh, electable parts where you have much more of the program inside. But with that, you only reach 10, 50% of the future teachers. Um, but it's, uh, I think that there is going on a movement, but it's much more slowly in contrast to the school level. The schools are in fact much more innovative in contrast to the universities. Okay, you have some colleagues who are very innovative, but the system, when I see the system, the system in the school is, is more willing to go on with that than the system on university levels. And it's a, a very individual decision sometimes on university level, because if one colleague participating, then you have, the, you have the implementation. If one colleague are not willing to implement it, yeah, you are not able to change a person who stays for the whole life on this position. Okay. Thank you, Johannes. Now, before I give uh, the floor the chance to perhaps uh, ask some questions, I want to go back real quick to Mark. Mark, as a mindset evangelist, as uh, Johannes and uh, Eva indicated that at primary school level, you have a teacher who has a uh, control over you know, two or three dozens of kids and they spend hours and hours every day uh, uh, teaching them or, or basically interacting with them and they know them pretty well. And this is getting less and less until you get to the university level where basically the professor does not even know all the students unless you are extraordinarily different. Either you're extremely smart or you're extremely stupid. Yeah, so uh, then they will probably know you. So talking again about mindset, is it really possible, at least at the higher education level, you know, uh, 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 is there like a, a way how, how uh, you know, we can actually still be inspiring and and having people transform. Uh, I, I'm talking about adult students here now, uh, especially at the university level, uh, without actually knowing them one by one, you know, so like at the primary level. So what do you say to that? Yeah, I, uh... It is, uh, undoubtedly it's challenging. It's no doubt challenging, but I think the advantage of adults is that we have a better understanding of, how, of ourselves to be able to get information from a professor or someone like that, to be able to, to use that information to change ourselves. And really, uh, you know, uh, it's unfortunate, but we haven't really taught, um, now we are in the school system teaching us how to teach ourselves. And um, I, it's, it's difficult, but I think as I'm showing, I just uh, dropped the core and sabotaging money beliefs into the uh, chat there if you want to download it. And what I'm finding out for adults is that, yes, it is absolutely difficult. It takes a lot of work to help to change the mindset of, of an adult. And the older you get, the harder it is because their belief systems are ingrained in our mind and we don't know why we do what we do because most of our beliefs are formed before age se before age uh, seven 
right? And at age seven, our minds literally start to, there is a portion of us up to age seven, you're actually in beta in your mind. Literally, you're at a beta, le um, sorry, delta level in your the waves of your mind. And then we stop really learning or absorbing at that level. And our mind changes to a beta level in terms of our thought pattern. And so it's very difficult to change. And that's the reason why the younger you can get your students in. And I think the Catholic Church once said, you know, if you can get someone before, uh, before the age of age of 11 or 12 as a child, you'll have them for life versus changing them. So absolutely, it's a little bit harder, but I think it can be done. There are now new technologies that you can use to understand your mind and how to change them. And in that presentation I sent you, it's, I think most of us here as adults have issues or money beliefs if you're not abundantly wealthy at the moment um, about money. And, you know, I've, indicated some ways of how to go about changing people's mindset as adults and you might find it interesting there for you so, so which one is harder dealing with uh, college students or dealing with uh, secondary high school students <laughs> who are in their puberty and with the raging uh, you know uh, emotion and all that you know rebellious attitude uh, well, what do you think? I mean, you understand them. I, I have no idea. I don't. Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't teach children, and I think you'll find that teachers will probably have a better answer answer than that than than myself <laughs> about that. So um, I'll leave that up to the teachers to answer. Um, out of complete respect for what they do, and it's such a difficult job that they have, whether it's high school, university, or primary kindergarten. Okay. I would like to add uh, to this some two aspects. There's one aspect, when you're working on secondary level, you're working with uh, the students over some years. And therefore you can see a development. That's something very nice for the teacher that he can also really see a development. At universities, it's very seldom that you have the chance, the chance to work with teachers a bit longer, with, with students a bit longer. Normally you see them for one semester, maybe a second one, and then that's it. Um, they, uh, it's, the, the universities have more a program-oriented touch and the split, uh, the, the, the seminars through the colleagues, very seldom they can see really a development of the person. It's uh, maybe in master programs when you have smaller classes, you could do this. Um, but there's one very large plus uh, for adults it's, you can be very transparent what you want to do with them. And when you are transparent, that you say, our idea is that, we, that it's important to be a op more open-minded person and we want, therefore we would like to support the, uh, person development in the field of mindset. And you can do this and that and that. Uh, adults can do a lot uh, because they can reflect. Uh, is it something what they need for them? It's important for them. And so uh, some of them, uh, you also uh, should believe in the individuals that they like to take over uh, also control for their own learnings and that they take over responsibility for their own development. Um, and I think it's quite nice when you say this as transparent, that's, that's the objective, what we like to do with you. But it's, I think it's a bit the same when you're on university level, you are promoting that someone should learn a, a language uh, because you always see them only in very small uh, steps. Um, but you see that when someone is learning a language, he's willing to learn the culture of another country. He's willing so, to learn so much more. And it's the same when you are doing this in a transparent way. I think so that then it, it, this is, of course, it's very nice with adults normally, because when they are willing to do something, they are willing to invest uh, in that much more time than a regular student would invest. Okay. Uh, I see here in the chat box, there's a, not a question, but a comment, I think, uh, rather from Phoebe One thing. Uh, she's from Chiputra University in Surabaya. So in my university, we use pre and post tests to see the changes of growth mindset scale after we perform the challenge based learning. And around 70% have significant change. 
this is a comment, I think. But I was wondering if if there is no uh, benchmark to a control group. Uh, I mean, normally in a research, you have to have like a, a group that receives some intervention that you actually test them before and after. And then you have another control group that do not receive the intervention. And then you also test them before and after, and then you compare both of them rather than have them all take the test, yeah, and have them all take the intervention. Uh, Johannes, I mean, he, as an academic expert, so uh, what do you say to that outcome of 70%? And I will get back to Mark and Eva as well uh, to, to give uh, his and her thought on that. Let's start with you, Johannes. I think it's a bit difficult to answer this question because it's um, you do not know the starting point from the learners, from the students when they start, um, how, how, on which level they are, which uh, socialization background do they have. And of course, we need to see that some students who start with an entrepreneurial learning activity, they have a good mindset in the beginning. Therefore, it's, um, it's uh, important uh, to, to, to see this, the, 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 the university students are a more diverse group normally. Therefore, they have different backgrounds, they have different uh, um, the development steps going through. Um, therefore, it's difficult to answer this. But I think if you have 50% of the students, in your opinion, where you find out that they have really a development of entrepreneurial mindset, a good development of entrepreneurial mindset, I would say that's a good, good uh, a, a result because 50% uh, means on university level and when you have a program which is just running one semester, wow, what a, what a change. Uh, in one semester, you changed really the mindset. That's a good result. Um, I think you cannot expect that 100% are, are really getting out a superb uh, outcome. Uh, that's, um, therefore, I think it's, it's always a question of the perspective. I think if 50% of the students are running very fine, super cool. Uh, it, of course, it's nice to have a higher percentage. Um, but, it, different, but sometimes it, it's also a question, um, not each student fits to each challenge in the same way. For some uh, students, particularly the beginning phase of a challenge is so important that they get really involved. Uh, for some students, some other challenges maybe are much more nice and effective uh, for them. Uh, and of course, we also see it's the same in the primary school, but like in the university, uh, the person who is learning together with the students or with the youngsters is a key important person. And some of them reflect very well to this person and some other one, I have really problems to do this with this person. Um, in, in, at the university, you have the privilege that we have several different persons who are working together with the adults. Therefore, hopefully there will be someone who are able to support them in a way how they like uh, to be supported. Hopefully this was an answer. Eva, I mean, I'm not sure if you have the uh, experience with more mature uh, students, uh, but maybe you can sort of say based on what you have learned, what you have observed so far in terms of the success rate, so to speak, in uh, transforming their character to be more entrepreneurial. What do you say? I have good luck that I can learn, uh, that I can work at primary level because of course it's easier for small kids to change the mindset. This is normal as the mindset has a lot to, to do with values. And this is what you learn in daily life when you grow up. I, I can uh, see this with my own kids. Uh, that uh, that I see how easily they can they can get everything that I had to learn when I I was quite aged <laughs> when I when I when I got in touch with this. So the younger the better. Uh, this is what I can say, and therefore I'm a, I'm a big fan of of using these methods uh, uh, from very very uh, for very young kids. I even uh, would like to develop uh, a program for pre 
school level. So we will do that one day, but at the moment we focus on what we have been developing and to see how to implement it properly. But uh, this would be the best. So this is the age where, uh, where uh, an attitude grows. So uh, of course, I think it's, it's a good rate, as Johannes mentioned, at, at, when, you are, when you are older, to, to, to change an attitude. It's much more difficult than to learn it from the very beginning. So this is my statement on it. <laughs> I mean, yes, thank you, Eva. I see, uh, for example, I mean, if you're dealing with smaller kids, then you are also talking a lot about, for example, their creativities uh, in solving problems. Uh, much more than perhaps business creation when we, you know, deal with university students. Yeah, because, you know, the reason why government wants to promote entrepreneurship education is because they want these students to create their own businesses after they graduate from college. Uh, yeah, but, but I, man, you have to start early because it's not about business creation; it's about entrepreneurial mindset, and it's uh, and this grows uh, earlier. So, so of course, we do not prepare them exactly for startups, uh, but we prepare them having the mindset to be open. That helps them in every every kind of life that they want to 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 realize later on. If this is a startup, or, or if they find themselves in another position, this is what is difficult to show. To, to, to governors that you have to start early. They always think it's early enough that you start in the secondary level, but this is not the, the tech. I'm very glad that we had politicians, that we found politicians in Austria that see this as an incredible chance to start in, a, in, a, in an early age. Yeah, so. Mark, as the follower of Angela Duckworth and uh, Carol Dweck, do you agree? <laughs> I, I well, personally, I just want to tell you guys that the reason why I started my personal journey in self-development and down into mindset was because I saw the Jamaican entrepreneurs. But like other people who start to research things, you benefit from yourself. And I found out I had a growth mindset. I had a fixed mindset, which was really low. Like I scored, I think, 1.2 when they used to have it out of five. And on grid, I was like 1.3. I was completely shocked that I could score so low <laughs> in those scores. And it explained to me in my life why I was not more entrepreneurial in terms of actually going out there. I was teaching entrepreneurs. I was an advisor to entrepreneurs. I was an accountant, investment person, but I didn't actually do it. And it taught me the reason why. And so it took me, you know, if to have 50% do it in one class and <laughs> to change your mindset for growth, that was astounding to me that you could do it because it took me a long time. It took me several months of several practices and course to change my mindset in both growth mindset, uh, to go to a growth mindset. And even today, I'm still learning things about it. And also grit um, and taking course. I took a course just in grit, <laughs> you know, just to change my mindset. And so it really is, it goes back to, uh, it's better when you get them young, because as I said, when you grow older and it's, you know, it's the reason why I, I've given you guys about the, to look at your money belief system and how hard it is for you to change because it's not one thing normally why we have difficulties. It's several beliefs that we've created and you know, the brain through neuroplasticity, through positive psychology, we now know the brain continues to grow but, and, and create patterns. But the issue is, is that by 20, we've created so many patterns <laughs> that, and the patterns that we don't even know about that we've created. And those are called beliefs. And then for us to try to change those, Sometimes those patterns are hooked with each other. So in money beliefs, you have all these what are called cluster patterns. And then to change one thing is not enough. You have to change all the beliefs around that cluster, which then makes it harder. So the easy thing is if you get an opportunity to be an Austrian, and fortunately for all those kids, when they're young, they get a chance to not to create those. They create the good habits right away, and therefore it's much easier. So I... Um, <laughs> that's 
those are my comments and thank you for Phoebe for sharing um, your your experience with um, with the actual students. I think 50%, wow, that is amazing <laughs> to me that but you were able I, to get those kind of results. You have seen, well, you have actually personally experienced two school system in Canada and in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I mean, how big of a difference when you look at the uh, school systems between the two countries? I'm not talking about the level of technology, uh, savviness and things like that, but just from the school system, especially at the primary and secondary level. I mean, I, is there a difference? You know, it's pretty funny that 95% of us, whether we're in Canada or around the world, we got bought into the system and we all got trained in the same way. Even though Jamaicans are much poorer than Canadians and Canadians have a way better education system, it's interestingly enough that because they had to be more innovative probably to survive, they are much more entrepreneurial than Canadians. And Canadians are much more into the, you gotta get a job, you know, we gotta get the highest value for your time. And they probably are less entrepreneurial than the people who are in Jamaica. The issue with the people in Jamaica is that they have a different issue. A lot of them don't believe that they deserve what they want. Not that they don't have this initiative to be creative. And Jamaica, as, a, as you may all know, is very popular into music because they have a lot of creativity um, into it. Like the whole reggae movement came out with Bob Marley and many other um, of these things from a very small country. But it is, a they have a different challenge in their mindset. Their mindset, it's about, you know, I don't deserve or I can't do it or they think so they think too small because they started in a very small island environment and so therefore what's big to them is like a couple million dollars in North America you know unless you're you're not considered rich unless you have billions these days or whatever and so their challenges are different I would think um, from it but in terms of pure creativity I would say that uh, being entrepreneurial they actually have an advantage because they had to be more, they saw their parents being more creative and entrepreneurial when they were younger. I mean, considering that Jamaica is always participating in the Winter Olympics, where they don't have <laughs> the snow in Jamaica, that's for me, that says something, you know, like how familiar you must be in order to win, you know, Winter Olympics, right? <laughs> Anyway, but, you know, that opens up actually the next topic for our next, which is the influence of local culture into the entrepreneurship education, because I think the environments, the parents, you know, the, the, the surrounding of, the, of these children certainly also shape, I mean, play a major role in shaping their mindset. You know, we see that when, for example, you are coming from an entrepreneurial family background, that your your father is a businessman, you tend to also follow the footstep of your father to be the next businessman. But if your father is a policeman, you know, or, or a military uh, personnel, you know, I mean, it is unlikely that the, the children, you know, would become a businessman because maybe the father would be against that idea and say, you know, what do you want to be, you know, uh, 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 that is something for uh, someone without college education. But if you want to, you know, be successful, be like me or something like that, or become a doctor, become an engineer rather than becoming an entrepreneur, right? So, but yeah, I mean, with that, uh, I'm going to give the floor another chance to give, uh, ask questions. Uh, but if there are no questions, I would probably ask each and every panelist to maybe say the last words or last uh, message. Uh, Tony, you have a question actually, or it's okay with you? Yeah, it's okay with me already. Actually, it's all answered from my- You have to speak up. I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Your- Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, it's better. Okay. Today is more clear for me, but anyway, we, we need to have a lot of teacher training and then we have to come back with the load map of the teacher training. So I think that uh, Professor Johan and you, I have to help me to start in Thailand. So actually we, we are looking for the step for one, two, three to start and then the framework because we are understand already the, the, the importance of the entrepreneurship in the primary and uh, secondary. But 
uh, today is more clear with the primary, but the secondary is different, right? When you, when you when you want to talk with the, the the teacher in different, but most of the Thai school, the primary school and secondary school is in the same school. So when we when we do the training, can we train them the same thing, or we have to split them? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I personally think that certainly uh, both uh, Eva and Johannes uh, have uh, presented a very good uh, concept and model, but I think personally that they cannot simply be just adopted and implemented in the in in schools in Indonesia or in Thailand, just as it is, because there's a lot of adjustments uh, that needs to also be done in order to have this curriculum function. Yeah, uh, because I, I think that the Austrians still have a different uh, mindset in general, uh, but it's more like a culture. Yeah, uh, being Europeans, for example, that you are more open, you are more critical, yeah, and you are more receptive uh, towards uh, failure, for example. Whereas, for example, for us in Asia, you know, our parents would be very, very angry if, if we come back home with with a red score, you know, with with a C or with a D instead of an A or a B, because they think failure is is, is something for for dummies, yeah, for and they don't want to have their children labeled as dumb because they're getting C's and D's. Uh, I mean, Europeans or, you know, uh, uh, Canadians, maybe they have different perception, but, you know, maybe not as much as the Americans where they always celebrate their failures, you know, and then they give you a party when you get a D. Yeah, so, uh, and yeah, say, oh, do more failures, then you will learn more. <laughs> so, but this is something that, I think that we have to also start thinking about our next discussion about actually the the national uh, uh, the national culture, the our own culture uh, uh, shape the mindset of the whole nation, and then we have to adjust the uh, new curriculum, entrepreneurship based curriculum to that culture so that fits. Yeah, because I think even teachers. Thing, you know, I mean, if their students are getting C's or D's, they think, oh, these students are, they need help, yeah, so because they're not smart, yeah, and they will be maybe not successful, but, you know, I mean, that is certainly not true, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, if there is no more questions, maybe uh, last words uh, from each and every distinguished panelist. Uh, Eva, we'll start with you before we close the session, maybe. Message or... For me, only success for whatever you choose in your country. And uh, I wish you really that that you can make a big change. I think it's worth doing it. So this is from me. Bye. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> Johannes? Um, I'd like to say two things as a, as a final thing. The, the first thing is, I think when you start with entrepreneurship education in a country, it's always good to make a pilot project because you need uh, to, sh to show how things are working in our own country. And of course, you can use experiences from other countries. You can use our materials. You can use our teacher training. But in the pilot, you need to implement it, regionalize it, add some things which are in the tradition of the country. Uh, the second perspective, of course, as we discussed yesterday, I think it's important to see uh, we all are living in a tradition, in our own culture. And normally it's not only one culture in a country. You have several cultures, particularly in a country which are that large like Indonesia or Thailand, where you have this very, very long tradition of a culture. And I think we have to see that we are coming out of this culture. Uh, as in Austria, we have the Christian religion as our background, in particular the Catholic tradition, which is much more conservative than the Protestant church. And we have to see this. This is in our insights, uh, although sometimes we believe we are very open-minded persons, uh, but we are in this tradition. And we have to know our own traditions when we want to implement um, experimental learning 
uh, elements and particular when we want to support the development of a mindset. I think that's, it's, this, is, uh, uh, this is not only a learning approach, it's a learning approach which is inside an ecosystem and inside an environment. And therefore it's important to see how you can make it fit for this environment where you are living in. Thanks a lot. And I think entrepreneurship education is changing the world. Therefore it's worth to do it. Yes. Thank you, Johannes. Mark, I know where. <laughs> I, 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 I would have to echo uh, Johannes that uh, I, first of all, I want to thank all of you for spending the time here with us to, in a effort to try to make the world a better place. And in so doing, it is amazing that we are trying to inspire others and to help others to become their best selves and to live the life that they want to live. And to me, that is the, that is the ultimate um, amazing benefit of an entrepreneurial mindset in education is that we give people the tools to enable them to live the life that they want to live. And so I wish you absolutely all the best in doing that for not only the people who you're teach, teaching, but also of yourself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. So with that, we have come to the uh, end of our uh, two-day workshop on entrepreneurship education, EDUCAM. So thank you for all your uh, participants and your patience to, uh, and also your questions, of course, to, uh, throughout the session. And uh, I also want to thank, uh, of course, the uh, Gen Thailand and Gen Singapore, and not to forget the Pembangunan uh, uh, Jaya University, who is generous enough to help us uh, to be the host of this webinar for two days. So uh, thank you. And uh, I hope we will uh, meet again at the uh, next opportunity discussing about more entrepreneurship education. Thank you. And uh, perhaps we want to take a picture together. I think we, we should have some uh, group in the Facebook so we can uh, miss each other every time we want and then we can make appointment over there <laughs> that okay, okay next next missing is is uh, next month or whatever because I think this is like uh, sometimes we, we need the input from everyone that we what we want to talk next time so so it's like we don't have to start from the first section again we can start from what we want to know and then so we can improve each other each country at the same time and then we can have a lot of things that we can show we can put the picture that we did and then we can follow each other together. Can we do that? <laughs> Certainly, we have the database of all the participants so we can create Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I, I can create the group and then we can invite each other because now we have a lot of uh, database that uh, we start and then the Thai people, sometimes they, they don't speak, they listen. But if you want them to put the pictures, you, if you want them to write something, Maybe you can see more Thai people in your in your group. <laughs> yeah, that's all Asians. You know, we don't ask questions. We otherwise we look we look. Yeah, awesome. today they, they cannot join and they give a lot of questions to me. And then Tony, can you ask this and that, this and that? But they, yeah, <laughs> this is the Thai. So you're uh, the speaker of the Thai participants, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, maybe one last thing, we take a picture together. So uh, maybe. Uh, uh, after you can help with this uh, okay, uh, please everybody see your please put on all your camera now camera i can see you all in your pajamas and uh, uh sleeping gowns or whatever yeah so uh, but don't worry we just keep okay. your face uh, okay we have two slide the first slide and we go on okay put on your camera put, put on, on your camera, your camera everybody okay 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 everybody is ready one two hey, three Three, say cheese. Cheese. Okay, thank you so much. Um, second. Just wait. just wait. Second screen. Okay, just wait for, for the second. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, the, the second. Okay. One, two, three, say cheese. Cheese. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. 
Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.